This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Dr. Berger uh, will go first. Um, his faculty practice is focused on complex dermatology and is largely based on referrals from other dermatologists. He is the director of clinics for the Department of Dermatology as well as the executive vice chair of the department and the associate director of the residency program. He was recently inducted into the UCSF Academy of Medical Educators, an honor bestowed on those dedicated to medical student teaching in the university. Um, he was awarded Teacher of the Year by the UCSF Dermatology Residence, and in 1989, he was honored with the Henry J. Kaiser Award for Excellence in Teaching. He has published more than 150 scientific articles, 30 book chapters, and three books. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Tim Berger. E evening, everybody. Um, it's, it's great to be here. I'm going to try to get my uh, IT stuff straightened out here. Um, so it's great to be talking about my favorite hobby, which is writing. Um, and uh, I was asked to talk at a medical conference last year uh, to physicians who are coaches for cycling teams. So I kind of converted the talk over for those of us who ride uh, to relevant things. This talk I sent in is the talk I gave. They'll hopefully recharge it with this, which is redirected. So um, as a physician at the university, I'm required to disclose any uh, outside interests I have. I do uh, talk to this company as a consultant. This is the company that decides what medications are on your prescription plan. Um, I'm going to talk about cyclists in the sun risk on and off the road, some things about the seat, and then a little bit about skin cancer um, and the diagnosis of skin cancer. OK. Um, so I, I listed some of the common patient uh, complaints or questions that we get. And uh, the first one is, um, if you're one of those persons who, every time you try to use a sunscreen, it either burns or itches. Um, what do you do about that? Um, and so here are some possible answers. Well, like use cocoa butter, try a stick or Vaseline-based sunblock, drink green tea. It has an antioxidant in it. It actually changes the rate at which you burn. Or ask a dermatologist. So the answer is actually B. Um, <clears throat> most people who are sensitive to sunscreens or complain of stinging actually don't have sunscreen allergy. They usually have mild rosacea or sensitive skin. Um, there's alcohol in many sunscreens, and it's the alcohol that burns. The sunscreens, like they sell in surfing shops, uh, which are meant to not wash off in water, um, and are kind of Vaseline-based, sting a lot less, don't, don't tend to run as much, and they're much better. And those sunblocks that contain only zinc and titanium, but no sunscreening agents, uh, tend to be less irritating because all the sunscreening agents, all those chemicals, are only soluble in, uh, in, in uh, oil. And so they have to put alcohol in to make them into a cream. So um, if you have really sensitive skin, picking a sunscreen that just has zinc or titanium in is going to probably be less irritating. So what about this SPF thing? Um, what SPF should I use? The labels are pretty confusing. Um, well, you can use an SPF. 15, since it blocks 93% of the sun. 
SPF 30, SPF 60, the SPF doesn't matter. The answer is B or C, and there's a reason. Um, the SPF written on the bottle is what's achieved in a test condition. And um, it's sort of like that mileage sticker on your car when you go to buy it. You never get that mileage. It's under some artificial test condition that you can never achieve. Uh, so when we put sunscreen on, we actually put on only one quarter as much as the test condition. And um, we'll talk about what the result is. And then the second thing is these higher SPF sunscreens actually block longer ultraviolet light, and those also cause cancer. So we like these longer wavelength sunscreens. Um, Normally, you should put on two milligrams per centimeter squared. You actually put on dot five, and the relationship is sort of like those curves, um, like this. And so, when you put an SPF 30 on, you actually get an SPF of three. And when you put an SPF 60 on, you actually get an SPF of six. Um, so, um, <clears throat> in fact, when you put an SPF 30 sunscreen on, you get only half as much sunblock as you do. Uh, with a 60, it's not at 95%, it's significant. And here's a paper that looked at this, and when you put on the amount that it says, you get 30, but when you put on the amount you really put on, you get three, or here 30 and kind of three. So you get about one-tenth as much as what it says on the sunscreen. So that's why you need these higher SPF sunscreens. Um, the other thing the SPF doesn't tell you is that the SPF number is for UVB. That's the burning rays, but not UVA. So UVA causes skin cancer. That's why tanning beds uh, cause skin cancer. That's why we have a law in California that prevents minors from using tanning beds without their parents' permission. Um, UVA suppresses your skin immune system. So if you have a little cancer cooking there, it just can grow. Um, and many people are on medications. Some of those medications cause you to be sun allergic, like naproxen or Aleve, quinine, which is in leg cramp medicine, or tonic water, doxycycline used for acne, hydrochlorothiazide, the most common antihypertensive. And these medicines induce sensitivity in the UVA range. So if you take Aleve before you ride, you need to put on a UVA sunscreen. OK, so sun protection, what's the most important thing? Well. Don't go out in the sun. That's the most important thing, <laughs> right? So seek shade, ride earlier, ride a little bit later. Don't ride right in the middle of the day. Sun protection, wear appropriate clothing, so cover up. Uh, in Australia, clothing is labeled with something called UPF. That's the clothing equivalent of SPF. Um, you can wash sunscreen into your jerseys uh, with this stuff called SunGuard. You put two packages in a load of wash, puts an SPF 50 sunblock in your jersey for 20 washings. So we do that every spring, my wife and I. And then you can use these creams of different types. Um, there's this sunscreen, Mexoral, and this sunscreen are the best ones for this UVA coverage. So if you're on medication, you want to find a sunscreen with these things in it. This is that SunGuard. It's a writ dye. It's about five bucks for one of these. You get two, put it in a load of wash, and for the whole cycling season, you are uh, got SPF 50 in your jersey. These are uh, sunscreens you can't get in the United States. You can get from Canada, and they contain this Mexoral sunscreen, which um, the FDA doesn't allow in high SPF sunscreens in the United States. Um, you can order these from Canada, or if you go across the border or to any other country except the United States, you can get these. Garnier makes a knockoff. It's called skin milk. This is Vanacream. Um, it's a company for patients with sensitive skin. So if you have allergies to sunscreen, real allergies, you can use this sunscreen because it's just zinc. Um, and uh, most patients who are intolerant to sunscreens can use this. It's sold at Walgreens. OK. True sunscreen allergy is really rare. And if you're allergic to a sunscreen, it could be the fragrance in the sunscreen, a preservative, or most commonly, the sunscreen itself. And so this Vanna cream, if you're really allergic to sunscreens. Now, the, the federal law, the FDA, changed the sunscreen labeling. And as of December of this year, 
all sunscreens that have good coverage, both UVA and UVB, can be labeled broad spectrum. So it'll say across the top broad spectrum in the same font as the SPF. Um, these sunscreens have an SPF number. It can go up beyond 50. And they can stick this on water resistant 40 or 80 minutes. And that means that you can put it on, submerge your hand in a whirlpool for either 40 or 80 minutes, and the SPF doesn't change. Um, waterproof doesn't mean anything. It's only that word, water resistance. So this would be what a new sunscreen would look like. This is sort of a mock-up, broad spectrum, SPF 30, so it's all the same font. They can't say waterproof. They can't say sweatproof. But they can say water resistant and the amount of time. And they can't use the word sunblock. So uh, most sunscreens are now being standardized. Uh, the SPF uh, hype is still confusing. Um, when do you put the sunscreen back on after you've used it? No need. Every two hours, every hour, every six hours. So the recommendation is about every two hours. Uh, if it's a waterproof sunscreen, it's good for 80 minutes. Uh, a full coverage or water-resistant sunscreen, so a few more minutes, two hours. Okay, how long do you have to wait to pull your clothes on after you put on your sunscreen? Um, two minutes, four minutes, six minutes, eight minutes. Turns out eight minutes. So if you wait only four minutes before you put your T-shirt over your sunscreen, you wipe out half of your sunscreen. But if you wait eight minutes, you only wipe out a quarter of it. So um, wait a few minutes. So put your sunscreen on before you go out. Um, I'm pretty covered up. Do I really need a sunscreen? Um, it kind of depends. Um, they actually put light meters on cyclists and triathletes and tested how much light they get. It turns out that there's an international standard that one MED, that's the amount of uh, light that'll burn an average person um, is about what you get in a long bike ride. So uh, that's OK. You might get a little pink. But if you do triathlons, you usually get about nine MEDs. So uh, triathletes really need to use sunscreen. Your head gets twice as much sun as your body, not a surprise. Um, so you need to put a sunscreen on to prevent skin cancer, especially in the areas of the head and neck. Um, <clears throat> so what do you know, want to know about what sunscreen, uh, what cancer looks like? You can go to this website right here. This is the core curriculum for all medical students in the United States in dermatology, and it has a lot of pictures about how to recognize skin cancer. Or you can go to the Skin Cancer uh, Association website here. Um, and there's a lot of pictures and information and education about sunscreen and skin cancer. OK, not a surprise. Cyclists get skin cancer where they get sun. So um, the places you want to make sure your doctor looks when they're looking at your skin is around your ears, on your face, and your neck, these areas that are not covered by your helmet. Um, and if you ride with regular cycling shorts and your Legs get in the sun, um, especially in women. About a quarter of all cancers and melanomas occur from the knees to the ankles in women. So uh, these are the areas that I'm careful to examine and you should pay attention to when you do your own self-exams and when your doctor examines your skin. So this is um, a patient of mine who's a cyclist. Um, I think he's about 70 now. He's been riding a lot. He lives up in northern Marin and he rides out to West Marin almost on a daily basis. Um, and this goes sort of in disorder, so he's got a skin cancer here, here. But if you look where he's got them, ear, forehead, ear, shoulder, neck, eyelid, forehead, temple. So these are all places of his head and neck and face, cheek, temple, and then here a melanoma <coughs> behind his ear. So right back here. So um, these are the areas that you have to make sure your doctor checks or Someone checks for you. If you see a dermatologist, make sure that they look in those areas. So it's this kind of triangle here. So I teach the residents if the person's a cyclist, which you can usually tell by their quads, um, <laughs> make sure you look behind the ear here uh, and check for any funny spots. Okay. 
Well, why do we like to be out in the sun? It turns out sun exposure is addictive, um, and different people get more addicted than others. Uh, it's just like drugs, right, and alcohol. So um, it turns out that when UV light hits your skin, it activates the areas in your brain that are like the satisfaction centers, like when you eat chocolate or have good experiences. Um, and people who that sort of feedback loop is really tight, they all move to Phoenix um, and lay out in the sun all day. Uh, one of our senior dermatologists moved from Minnesota to Phoenix, and he uh, quickly realized that all the sun-addicted people are down there because that's where they can get it every day. We know, like radiation, sun exposure is cumulative, so the more you get over time, the more cancer you get. Um, we, it took a while to prove this, but if you use sunscreen regularly, it reduces the amount of skin cancer you get, including melanoma. In Australia, they've proved this. Um, uh, they have pretty strict rules in Australia if your kid goes to school and they don't have sunscreen on, they can't go outside during recess, they have to wear a hat. Uh, they're serious about preventing skin cancer there and they have very strict rules. Um, if you use your sunscreen and protect your skin, you're not gonna make as much vitamin D as you probably should, and so you probably wanna supplement. If you're a bit younger, 400 milligrams, if you're uh, my age, 600 to 800, and if you have thin bones, uh, you may need to be on a higher dose. Unfortunately, cycling doesn't protect from osteoporosis like other weight-bearing exercise does. Okay, what about things on and off the road? So we'll talk about poison ivy and poison oak. That seems to be the most common problem people get when they go off the road. And what about road rash and how do we treat that? So um, I went into the bushes to use the bathroom, and now I got a rash. This is the story. Um, so these things, poison ivy, poison oak, the ginkgo tree is planted all over San Francisco. Mango skin, they all contain this oil. It's called urushiol, uh, or we call that rus. Um, and many humans can become allergic to this. Um, the rash is itchy, it's streaky, and it can form blisters. So this is kind of typical story. Guy went out in the bushes and kind of sat on the wrong bush and um, <laughs> got this streaky rash. Um, OK. So if you get poison oak, uh, the doctor has to decide what to do for you. And um, in general, they're going to try to decide that based on how bad your rash is when they see you. So <clears throat> when you first see the patient, you got to figure out how bad it's going to be. Um, usually, the more body that's covered and the faster it came on, the worse it is. So I kind of divide it like this. If it's just a few streaks and bumps, that's mild. If there's a few blisters and some redness, that's moderate. And then people get this really widespread swelling. They'll swell their eyes closed. Men get a lot of swelling on their penis. Um, those patients usually get treated with oral medications. So this would be mild poison oak. And the, and the way you kind of decide whether the difference between poison oak and a bug bite is that poison oak makes these lines like this, whereas bites make individual bumps that are in little lines, like breakfast, lunch, dinner, whereas this <laughs> makes just a line like that, right? So here, right? Lines. So that's mild poison oak, here lines with some blistering, here lines with blisters. Um, many of these pictures were taken, and this is getting a little bit more severe here. Many of these pictures were taken, I don't know how many of you have lived um, in San Francisco since they, before they cleaned up Fort Point, but when you come through the Presidio and get ready to go up to the bridge, you can go down to that road to Fort Point, right? And that used to be like a forest of poison oak. They used to even have a big sign there that said, Caution Poison Oak. Um, and many of these guys just were soldiers on the base, and I was a dermatologist there on the Presidio. Um, so we would see them having gone to Fort Point. Oh, you ran by Fort Point? Oh, OK. You know, how'd you come back? Well, I ran up the hill. OK. You have poison oak. So this is more severe, a lot of swelling in the part of the center part of the face. And then men, you know, kind of like don't wash their hands before or after they go to the bathroom. So they end up with that. And then people who get this, this is going to be a problem, right? They just turn red and swell up. So if you have mild disease, you can usually get a strong cortisone in a tube and use it a few times a day. It'll usually clear up. 
Um, if you have really severe swelling like this, um, you probably should take prednisone if there's no reason not to. You need to take enough, so about one milligram for every kilogram of your body weight. That means an average adult, 68 milligrams. And the Medrol dose packs that you usually get, which are five days, are not enough. You need to take it for a couple of weeks. On average, an outbreak of poison oak will last about two weeks. Okay. So, Doc, if I crash off the road into the bushes, or I go into the brush and think I may have been exposed to, pose, exposed to poison oak, what should I do? So take a shower with Technu, take a shower with dishwashing liquid. Since this allergen is an oil, maybe I should like degrease my skin with goop, right? Or it doesn't matter, there's nothing you can do once it's on, it's on. So people study this stuff, right? So they did this study here, um, and um, they took a dishwashing liquid. They happened to use Dial Ultra, but you could use any dishwashing liquid. Goop, right, oil-removing compound, or Technu, <coughs> right? And then what they did is they put Roos on people, and then they washed it, and then saw what the reaction was. And it turned out that you reduce by about 60% if you use one of these kinds of things um, <coughs> compared to not washing at all. So washing as soon as you can makes a difference with something that takes the oil off. But these numbers are not statistically different. And to wash yourself with Technu costs a buck and a quarter. And to wash yourself with this other stuff costs about seven cents. So just get your dishwashing liquid and wash with that uh, if you get into poison oak. OK. So wash as soon as you can. Wash your clothes. Remember to wipe down your shoes. The oil can remain on leather and plastic surfaces for months. Wipe down your bike, maybe your bike seat, if you took your bike into the bushes. And then if you rode home in your bike clothes and you sat on your car seat, then wipe down your car seat. I had this patient who kept coming and she said, I'm really allergic to poison oak and I can't figure out, but I'm getting it over and over again. So then once we figured it out, her boyfriend was a landscaper, and he had a partner. So he and the partner went to work in his pickup. The partner drove, and he rode on the passenger side. And on the weekend, he and his girlfriend went out on a date, and he drove, and she sat in the passenger side. Turns out her boyfriend wasn't allergic to poison oak, so he'd wander all through the poison oak, sit in the passenger side. He'd go pick her up Friday night. She'd sit in the passenger side, and then she'd get poison oak, and she could never figure out where it was from, and it was from his clothes onto the car seat, and then she got it. So people who are really sensitive uh, can pick it up from these inanimate surfaces. Um, shoes tend to be a big problem uh, because people don't think of them. They wash their clothes, but they don't wipe down their shoes. OK. So I get poison oak really easy, and it's really bad. You know, I had it three times this summer. Is there anything I can do to prevent getting poison oak? Sorry, no hope. Yes, there are things you can buy in the drugstore. So the answer is, yes, there are things you can buy in the drugstore. And here's another study. People study this stuff, right? Um, so they put this, this is poison oak rash in medical terms. And this stuff is sold in the drugstore, Stoco Guard, Hollister, Moisture Barrier, and Hydropel. There's a lot of other brands, Ivy Shield, Sun Shield, Dermafilm. Uniderm, you see they don't work very well. But these three reduce the severity of the roost by about 50%. So if you're one of those people who, you know, like you are in your car and you drive by the trail and you get poison oak, you want to buy some of this stuff and put it on, right? And there's another um, thing that's called Ivy Block. And it works. And, and the way that these work is that they're an oil. These three are an oil. And the oil binds the poison oak oil up more than your skin. So it leaves it on the surface of your skin, keeps it there until you wash it off. So then you get less poison oak. And this ivy block is actually clay, bentonite clay. So the oil gets on there, gets sucked into the clay, and then you can wash it off. So there is technology to reduce the severity. So if you're going to be riding off-road, uh, you know there's poison oak up there, 
you may want to put some of this stuff on if you tend to get poison oak. OK. So if you're going to not get roost dermatitis, know what the plants look like. Wash after exposure. Wash your stuff. You may need to use these preventive things. You need to be careful if you're allergic. Um, mango peel. The skin of the mango doesn't have it, but the mango peel does. So we see people come in all the time. They got this rash like this. And I'll just say, you ate a mango? I said, and they're really good, right? So you ate it like that? And they go like, yeah, yeah, how'd you know? I said, yeah, OK. Uh, turns out ginkgo, also the ginkgo nuts and the ginkgo leaves have this roost in it. And the lacquer tree, which is a tree that they make lacquer out of, you know, the lacquer wear. Um, and some people are so sensitive that that also makes them break out. And they do put roos in some Chinese food. Um, so it's like this poison oak chicken that they make. And if you're <laughs> really allergic to that, eating that can make you break out. Um, there, there used to be things where you would eat like small amounts of poison oak, and the idea was that that would make you break out less. It was like, you know, develop tolerance. Uh, they don't work. So what would happen is you would eat it, and then you'd get poison oak at the other end, and uh, you still broke out. So uh, that's not sold anymore, and that we don't do. OK. So this is what poison oak looks like in the springtime, right? Leaves of three, let it be. Um, and then as the weather gets drier, they look a little bit more purple like this. And these are the other things that uh, cross-react. <clears throat> Indian marking nut, that's what the laundry puts on your clothes, you know, when they put it on that little label. Uh, and cashew nut shells, but most people already get the cashew nuts out of the shell, so that's usually not a problem. And then ginkgo. There's a ginkgo tree right in front of our office, so when somebody doesn't know what ginkgo is, I just have them go out and look at it. Ginkgo tree is the only um, species in that whole f um, family. It's like a dinosaur tree. It's kind of cool. OK, so what happens if you hit the road and you get road rash? Um, how do you take care of that? So um, the first thing you want to do is you want to wash the area really well. Um, don't use really harsh soap, but kind of clean all the grit out of it. Um, you may want to use a little bit of a wash rag or gauze. You don't want to have any foreign material left in the wound. A water pick is sometimes helpful if it's a pretty big gash. Um, and sometimes you can use some peroxide, and that'll kind of soften up. Uh, any crust and crud and get the junk out. So you want to get all the junk out of it because that foreign body can make a reaction. And then the best thing to apply to a healing wound is just Vaseline. Wounds heal better when they stay moist. Topical antibiotics don't help. Um, there isn't any cream you can put on anything that makes it heal faster. Um, so just plain Vaseline. And then you want to put something on it that doesn't stick. Um, and um, <clears throat> you can use things like Telfa pads. Uh, but you want to just lay that over the area and then tape around. If you put something on that sticks, then every time you peel it off, all that little skin that's trying to grow in um, gets torn off. So this wet to dry stuff, um, we, we don't like that. We like wet to wet. Uh, just keep it moist. OK. There are special dressings that allow water to stay on the inside, but air to move back and forth through. We call these semi-permeable dressings. And these have been the most important thing in changing the way wounds heal in the last 50 years, probably. And these are sold over the counter, and I'll show you some. OK. You want to try to protect with either a sunscreen or clothing an area uh, where you've had an injury, especially if you're olive complected, because that area will uh, tan more, and then you'll end up with a brown spot. So you want to keep the sun off your scar for a while. And don't put topical antibiotics on, because you have a high chance of becoming allergic to the topical antibiotic, and then you get a rash on top of your road rash. So that's not good. This is a really common thing that happens uh, in our office. So this is Band-Aid's brand. Um, 
There are many others of these. Walgreens and all the stores have their own over-the-counter. And it's, it's sort of like a gel that just kind of goes over. And they have them for fingers and bigger ones. And you can put it over the area, kind of sticks, but, but is gummy. You can leave it on for three, four days. Uh, and then just when it washes off in the shower, just put on another one. Uh, so if you use this, because it kind of holds the water in, you don't have to put as much Vaseline on underneath. Um, and these, these are nice uh, products. And they come, they're kind of flexible. So if you've got like your knuckles knock, you know, scratched up, you can put it over the knuckles. See, this is like a knuckle one here. So you'd put it over your finger and you can still move your hands, work your brakes. OK, so what about your seat, right? Um, so when I ride a lot, I get pimples on my behind. Um, what should I do? Well, could it be an infection? Should we take a bacterial culture? <coughs> should you take some oral antibiotics? How about soaking in a tub with Epsom salts? Or how about rubbing some deodorant on your backside? OK, well, the. The most important thing first, if you get a lot of pimples in your uh, backside, is to make sure you don't have staph, staphylococcal infection. It turns out humans carry staph in their groins. Uh, staph is everywhere in gyms. Um, it lives every place where it's moist and people sweat. Uh, it, you know, the 49ers played uh, the Rams one year, St. Louis, and um, <clears throat> the Rams had an outbreak. Then they came here, used the visiting facility. During the game, the Ram players infected the 49ers. Then the 49ers infected their training facility. So there was this huge staff epidemic that went through all this skin-to-skin -skin contact and through the training facilities. So that kind of tells you where staff lives. It like lives in the gym, and it lives where it's moist. Um, and so it lives in our groins and our armpits and up our nose. Um, so if you start getting pimples and bumps, especially if they're big, uh, on your backside, those may be an infection, and you may have staph, and so you need to get that checked. Um, so the most important consideration here is to separate an infectious, or staphylococcal folliculitis, from other forms of folliculitis. So you take a culture, and um, while you're waiting for the culture to come back, you can just use like some Oxy-10 or something. Uh, benzoyl peroxide wash, it's an acne wash, it's available over the counter, and that'll kill staff. Staff can't become resistant to it, it kills all staff, hospital staff, non-hospital staff. Um, it's a little drying, so you do it kind of once every other day. Uh, but that you can do, and that often is enough, and you don't need to really take an antibiotic. Um, most of the time when we take a culture, we'll get this like normal skin bacteria thing. Um, and in my experience, that's uh, the most common result. So what are we going to do? We can take an oral antibiotic anyway. We can put antiperspirant on. We can put on a topical antibiotic. We can put on a topical antifungal because maybe this was normal skin bacteria, but maybe there's like yeast there. Well, it turns out it's the antiperspirant that we use, um, and that's what works. Um, and it turns out that um, these things that happen uh, on our backside are mostly little bumps around hair follicles. They're a form of folliculitis. And it has a lot of names. Um, it was called gene folliculitis. There was a big outbreak of this when um, Saturday Night Fever happened. And John Travolta started wearing those really tight pants. Um, and then we started seeing a lot of it. Um, it's been called uh, pantyhose folliculitis from the friction of pantyhose. Sport short folliculitis, you know, from lycra and rubbing. Um, and it's a form of mechanical acne. So when you rub your skin, it induces acne. So it's acne mechanica. And it has all these different names. So this, maybe we could call it bike short folliculitis, is the most common cause, in my experience, of these pimples. So they're a form of frictional acne, and they come from sweating occlusion, so it's covered. You sweat, it's covered. The moisture stays there, and then there's this friction. So um, the one thing we can do is we can reduce the sweating, right? So that's what the antiperspirant does. And it turns out if you do that, it actually gets better. And you do it about twice a week. You just take an antiperspirant, you kind of roll it over your backside, and um, that'll stop this. Um, 
So you can just use a regular, it has to be an antiperspirant, not a deodorant, right? Because antiperspirant has aluminum chloride in it. Um, and that's what stops the sweating. <clears throat> um, and then make sure that your bike clothes are dry and clean. I don't have to say this for the ladies in the crowd, but for the guys, you know, we try to not wash us, our clothes quite as often, and so uh, we need to make sure. Okay, this, this is the last thing we're gonna talk about in this section, and this are these nodules that happen. Uh, they've been described as third testicles, or in women, they make a big lump on uh, the lip on one side. And um, <clears throat> these are bicycle or bikers or cyclist nodules, or this clever term, third testicle. And what happens is the fat in that area, it turns out your fat is the most easily damaged tissue in your skin. It has the worst blood supply, and when there's trauma, it's what dies first. And so what happens is right where the seat bumps up onto you, you know, you kind of are on a bumpy road, you're hitting that, and it's bouncing up there. The fat can actually die in a lump. And so then you've got this lump of dead fat under there, and it's oil, right? Your blood is water, so there's nowhere for this to go. And so it just kind of sits there, and it forms a cyst around it. It takes a long, long time to go away, weeks. Um, so this is not an infection. It's not a tumor or anything. It's just dead fat. Um, so the treatment is just to protect the area, and sometimes if you inject a little cortisone in it, it'll get better. So if you get a lump down in that area right where your seat sits on, bumps into you, it could be one of these cyclist nodules here. Okay, so um, I'm gonna take about 10 minutes and run you through a, the same primer we give our medical students on how to diagnose skin cancer. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about skin cancer because um, we're outdoor people and in California, um, there's a lot of melanoma. So it's a serious problem, don't mess around. If you have a question, see your dermatologist and make sure that anything that gets cut off of you gets sent to a pathologist who knows what they're doing, specifically a dermatopathologist. There's a one year training for um, pathologists to study skin um, and these people know what they're doing around these pigmented lesions. These pigmented lesion biopsies are the hardest biopsies to interpret in uh, our pathology and are the number one cause of lawsuits for doctors who interpret slides. So make sure you have somebody who's smart look at this. So this is not a melanoma. This is a seborrheic keratosis. It looks kind of stuck on. It's got these little holes. It looks kind of like a strawberry stuck on your skin. This is perfectly benign. We all start to get them when we're 40 to 50, and they tend to come around the trunk, um, and nothing needs to be done about this. Now, they start around 40. They're kind of stuck on. They're kind of this waxy texture. They can be pretty big, and we really don't need to do anything. The doctor can freeze them or flick them off if they bug you. So what about moles? Well, we classify moles like benign moles and melanoma, and then among the benign moles, there's sort of the regular ones and then these atypical ones. And we, we like to separate these two because the people who have these funny moles, so if you have these funny moles, your risk for cancer is much higher. So like normal moles, okay, we all have them. Funny moles, a lot of us have them, but those of us who have them, it could be a marker for increased melanoma risk. So. First rule, all moles change. You're born with no moles, and if you live to be 90, you die with no moles. So the moles have to appear and go away, right? They start flat before you go through puberty. Then they grow during puberty or during pregnancy. And then uh, as time passes, their pigment disappears, and um, they get, like, like the rest of us, they get replaced with either fat or fibrosis, you know, <laughs> after age 60, and then they start to disappear, right? So this is like a mole, right? It starts here, you're seven years old. Now you're nine or 10, now you're 14, now you're 30, now you're 50. That's the same mole, it just kind of goes through that cycle. Whether a mole has hair in it or doesn't, doesn't make any difference, it could be bad, it could be good. Uh, it's an old wives' tale that the hair means it's good or bad. Okay, everybody who's fair has moles. 
Um, they occur in areas where you have sun exposure. So they did this really interesting study. They went to this city in Australia and the same and a city with the same name in Ireland where all these people from Australia came, right? So the people in Ireland have never seen the sun. The people in Australia and like Northern <laughs> Australia, they're like baked from the minute they come out of the uterus. And so you just start doing mole counts. And about age four, the kids in Australia are having moles. Meanwhile, by age nine, there isn't one mole in the class of the kids in Ireland. So um, the amount of sun you get determines the number of moles you get. And about half of melanomas arise in moles. So these are sort of like the seed that uh, allows some melanomas to occur. Most moles are going to be five millimeters in diameter or less. So that's the size of a pencil eraser. So if you can put a pencil eraser over your mole, it's in the good side. Now, size, number, and pattern predict melanoma risk. And if you have more than 50 normal moles, you're twice as likely to get melanoma. So lots of moles mean you got lots of sun, and that means you have more risk for melanoma. So this is normal moles, I hope, because this is my arm. Um, <laughs> and you can see here's the ruler right here, and this is five millimeters, so most of these are kind of uniform in color. They're round, oval. Uh, they're kind of symmetrical. Uh, and they're small. Now, atypical moles are bigger. They're not in sun-exposed areas. And often, people have a lot of these. And these can be inherited. And those are the people who have lots of these moles that run in families who get melanoma. So now, here's the ruler, right? Here's five. See, look at these moles. They're bigger. They don't look as uniform as those other moles. This person has three to five times greater risk to get melanoma than I do. So the things we look for in moles that are not good, bad border, bad color, multiple shapes, um, all these are associated with increased risk. If you have a mole that changes, that's the most important reason for you to see your dermatologist or your doctor. Although all moles change, it doesn't mean that when your moles change, it's changing in the right way. So this mole here, this woman was Italian. She had only four moles, one of which was one of these atypical moles right here. And that's her melanoma that grew in that atypical mole. So you don't need a lot of moles. She was Italian. She could tan. Uh, but that didn't protect her from getting melanoma. OK. How serious is melanoma? One in 50 men and women will get melanoma during their lifetime. About 75,000 new cases a year. About 10,000 deaths. One person dies of melanoma every hour in the United States. Um, and melanoma is the most common cause of death for young adults, 25 to 20. 25 to 29, and second most common for 15 to 29. So melanoma strikes at all ages. I don't know if you guys remember, the quarterback from Cal got diagnosed with aggressive melanoma, and you know, it's about 30 years ago, I guess. And then he decided he was a, actually a Heisman Trophy kind of super quarterback. And then he, is, he had metastatic melanoma. He decided to play his senior year and then died of metastatic melanoma. So he was a quarterback at Cal. You know, he's 25 years old. And when I was in the Army, we regularly saw young people with melanoma. So this is a young person's disease. Uh, a lot of cancers, you know, you don't get it until you're 40 or 50. But this starts pretty quick. OK. Now, the key with melanoma is finding it and treating it early. So if you treat it early, you find it, it's cured. You cut it out, it's done. You're saved. 99% chance you're going to be cured. This was this number was about 65% 30 years ago. So the people at Harvard, Tom Fitzpatrick, who's now dead, decided that what we're going to do is educate doctors and patients about what bad moles look like. And we took this number of bad, or we, we took the survival number from 65% to 85%. So that's good. Uh, but 85% is still not good enough. Uh, means 15% of melanomas are fatal. Um, if you have a lesion that gets big, you almost always die. Um, if your lesion spreads, it's almost always fatal. Chemo doesn't work. There's a whole bunch of new melanoma uh, therapies that are targeted, many developed based on research from researchers sitting right here 
in this campus. And those therapies work for a while, but the tumors figure out how to get around them. So this is a very active area of research, um, and hopefully we'll do better. But for right now, when you get a brown <coughs> spot, have your doctor look at it and get it cut out if it's not right. So that's still the treatment of choice. So we use the ABCDE rule, asymmetry, border, color, diameter, evolution, meaning change. So asymmetry, you put a line down the middle, the two sides aren't the same, like this. So you can't make a Rorschach out of that. Border, it's not regular, right, like this guy. See, he's got a little notch here. He's, he's looked in the mirror every day. He's had that on his face for about seven or eight years. But there's a little melanoma sitting there. You can see he's had a lot of sun. Color, colors that are bad, easy to remember, red, white, and blue. Um, red means lots of blood vessels. Cancers need blood vessels to grow. White means that your immune system is trying to kill the melanoma, so it wipes out the pigment, and blue, that's deep blood vessels underneath feeding the cancer or the cancer growing deep. So those are all bad things, like this. Lots of different colors. Okay, big, bigger than a pencil eraser, see here? So here's this black thing and here's the white, right? A um, little bit of blue and gray right in here. So that's a melanoma, you see two centimeters, way too big. Evolution, changing. Changing mole, not good. So this is one of those young persons who's in a family that has a lot of these atypical moles, right? So she gets a picture taken of herself every six months. So we do this standardly for these patients. And mark and map their moles, right? So here you can see she's got all these moles. But in this spot here where she's got no mole now, she's got another mole now, that's a melanoma. So. It wasn't that that thing looked so bad, it was that it kind of grew while everything else sort of stayed the same. So that evolution is important. I think the, the one important thing to know is that death rate from melanoma has fallen in all groups, women, young women, older women, young men, except older men. Older men are having an increasing death rate from melanoma, and uh, we don't understand why that is. What about basal cell cancer? Basal cell cancer is the most common kind of skin cancer. 50% of Caucasians will get a basal cell. So, you know, Reagan had it on his nose, uh, Dick Cavett had it. A um, lot of people have had it. Um, you get this if you're fair, you've had a lot of intense exposure like long weekend bike rides. Um, and this is a patient of mine I saw about 25 years ago who got this sore on her face, and she kept going to the doctor. She was only 23. So they said, well, you're too young to get a skin cancer, so nobody ever biopsied it. So you're never too young to get skin cancer, and if you've got something that doesn't heal up, make sure somebody looks at it. So remember, look behind the ear. This is a place where cyclists get their cancers, and here's what a basal cell looks like in that area. It's kind of pearly and raised like this. This is a basal cell on the back. Here's another one. This is the kind you get on your anterior shin. It looks like a little patch of eczema, but it kind of doesn't go away. Not itchy, gets a little sharper border. A little scaly may break down a little bit. That needs to get biopsy. Okay, thank you all very much. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Yes, sir. So how often should we go to the dermatologist to have a look at our moles? Yeah, so it depends on your age and your risk, right? So when, when I see a patient um, for the first time, I'll tell them, check yourself, have your primary doctor check you, have, come back and see me, or go to our special clinic where you're going to get pictures. So you end up having to figure out what box you're in, right? So if you're past the age of 40 and you're Caucasian, um, and you've had a fair amount of lifetime sun, you're in a 50% lifetime risk for, mel uh, for basal cell cancer. So you probably should see a dermatologist kind of once a year or every two years. And at the first visit, you should sort of have an assessment of what your skin cancer risk is, um, and then how often you see the doctor is determined by that. Um, so it's really an individual thing. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, Tegaderm is kind of one of these semi-permeable dressings that sort of stretches over, uh, and it's great. Yeah, it's flexible, it allows air to move through, uh, but holds the water and the moisture in. So that's, thank you for bringing that up. I'll add it to the slide. Yes, ma'am. So I have a question. Um, it seems, um, um, in the in two questions, the sunscreen, the ones that I that are coming out now, they say broad spectrum. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, the broad spectrum, but also they, can, they have chemicals. The chemicals can cause cancer, the skin cancer. So this is a, this is a big controversy. Yeah, exactly. there's, a, there's a group in San Francisco called the Environmental Working Group. Yes, um, and... Um, they make a lot of uh, effort mm -hmm. at uh, convincing people that sunscreens are carcinogenic. Um, we personally don't believe those things, but if you are concerned about that, yes. they agree that sunscreens that contain only titanium, micronized titanium, are probably of no risk. So micronized zinc is absorbed that's probably not bad, because zinc is an essential mineral. Uh, and then whether these other sunscreens really do anything or not um, are like pro-carcinogenic. Um, there's huge scientific argument. Because if you take animals that are prone to get cancer and you do things to them, they get cancer. And many drugs and many things that you do to those are, are not predictive of human outcomes. So for instance, Retin-A or vitamin A, which is in like every topical cosmetic. If you take the right mouse and the right set of conditions, you can prove that those topical vitamin A's reduce skin cancer, don't affect skin cancer, or increase skin cancer. <laughs> so depending upon how you do the study, you can show those effects in animals. And so it's very hard to, to do this. If you take people in Australia, and you give them sunscreens, not just these titanium-containing ones, but broad-spectrum standard sunscreens, they get less skin cancer. They get less melanoma. So that's the field test. Um, yeah. Yes? The other thing is, like, uh, the fact that the studies done that the, the, the food that workers who work in the sun, they don't get skin cancer. Um, that's not true. Um, so, um, in fact, they did a very interesting study of the fishermen who f fish at the Chesapeake Bay. So, at the Chesapeake Bay, that's near Washington, D.C., and it's near the National Observatory. So, they actually know the amount of light that has hit the surface of the Earth in every wavelength that's been measured for the last, since they've had measuring equipment. And then they went to those fishermen, and they asked them what kind of fish they fished for, because it turns out that in the Chesapeake Bay, you can only fish for fish at certain times of the day, right? And, um, and so then they could predict the person's total lifetime sun exposure, because they knew every day they went fishing and how much sun hit the earth at that place on that day. And it turned out for squamous cell carcinoma, there was a direct relationship between the amount of sun you got and uh, the time that you were, uh, and the number of cancers. So you got cancers bending upon the amount of sun you got over your life. For basal cell cancer, it turned out it wasn't related. Um, and so, in fact, basal cell cancer is related to intermittent intense exposure. So we know uh, the relationship between sun exposure and cancers. Um, whether tanning protects you and whether um, <coughs> working outside and having weathered skin really helps, there really isn't evidence for that. I, I worked at San Francisco General for a long time, and plenty of Hispanic people who were farm workers get skin cancer. We see plenty of Chinese-derived people. If you ask them if they've come here from China, where they're from, they're from southern China. They usually didn't live in a city. They usually worked in a rural area. So we do not believe that those behaviors are protective. And if you go to Texas, where I went to medical school, you see plenty of people who have been outside and are not protected from getting skin cancer. So the evidence, the epide all the epidemiologic evidence we have suggests that the more sun you get, the more likely you are to get skin cancer. Yes, sir? Is topical antibiotic good for anything, or should I just throw it all 
Um, so if you have uh, recurrent folliculitis in your beard area, sometimes using a topical antibiotic as an aftershave helps in that setting. Um, there are some other settings in which we use it, ulcers that are slow to heal, we sometimes use topical antibiotics. But neomycin especially is very sensitizing. So in 32 countries, you actually can't buy topical antibiotics that contain neomycin. That includes Canada, uh, because it causes too much problems. Yes, sir. Uh, can you talk about wash that you can use, a, a product sunguard, I think, for washing your clothes? Yeah. Um, call me silly, but I thought if you wore clothes, you didn't need sunscreen. Yeah. So it turns out it depends upon how moist the clothes get and how tightly woven the clothes are. So you can get clothes that have a UPF of 50 or a UPF of 2. Um, and it depends upon the weave. Essentially, if you can pick the clothes up and look through it, obviously, some light is coming through it, right? So um, uh, if you're out for a long time in high sun, um, your sun's, your um, Jersey may not protect you. Now, that, that's compounded by the problem that, of course, our jerseys aren't labeled here in the United States. You can go to REI and buy clothes that have like sunblock in it. The reason it has that sunblock in it, it's that it got washed in that stuff. And it has a tight weave. So <coughs> yes, I'm going to have to stop here, I think, in a minute, what maybe answer questions in the back. Sunburned? Are you fooling yourself and you're still getting damaged? OK, so uh, this, this is a very important question. Um, it turns out that as you get older, your skin reacts less well. And so you get the same amount of sun. You don't get pink, but you have sun damage. So the younger you are, the more your skin reacts appropriately to the sun. And the older you get, you actually are accumulating sun damage without having the reaction to it. So um, you, do, you do need to be careful. One more question. That's it. Yes, sir. Um, I'll, I'll come to the back and answer are others. Spray on so that it's effective? Yep. Yeah. They are. Mm -hmm. okay, and what about um, sunlight going through the basin? Yeah. So there are some sun. The problem is there is no sunscreen that, if it runs down in your eyes, doesn't burn like a banshee. You know. So, <laughs> so if you want to make a jillion bucks, other than you know inventing Facebook, find a sunscreen that when it gets in your eyes, it doesn't hurt. Um, so there is something called scalp screen that you can put in. It's designed for people with thin hair. Um, but, but. You know, normally you're kind of moving your head around, but if you really don't have much hair there, you may want to put a sunscreen on there. We do regularly see people get sunburned in their parts, so I'll be in the back, um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you all very much. Thank you.